Okay, we're going to get started. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Joel Kirshen, and uh, I've been an educator in uh, the LCMS for uh, my whole professional career. I was a teacher, a principal, and, uh, and a district exec for the California, Nevada, Hawaii district. Um, my identity now is none of those. My identity is a member of Redeemer Congregation in Redwood City, um, where I serve as a leader. And that's really uh, my, uh, my home now and how I see myself. Uh, Corey, would you go to the, the next slide, please? This, um, this uh, and it now says eight myths of productivity, and I'll explain why I needed to add another one, um, comes from um, a larger uh, leadership class that I wrote and I'm now teaching uh, in our district called the Heart and Soul of Leadership. And it has five classes in it, Humbition, uh, the Paradox of 21st Century Leadership, and Mindfulness, Winning at Ministry and Life, which this section that we're going to be talking about, the productivity myth, comes out of that one. Strategic planning from vision to your daily to-do list, coaching, uh, saying less and asking more, and managing conflict, how to have a good fight. And um, the genesis for this course actually um, uh, came from my senior pastor who, uh, uh, or our senior lead pastor we call him, Paul Schultz, and he was supposed to be sitting in that chair today, um, but he had a knee injury and the doctor told him to keep his knee up. But I wanted to thank Paul, so I'm going to do it anyway, even though he's not here, because um, he's the one who gave me the encouragement um, to do this uh, in taking a class that he offers at our church on how to find your mission in life. And um, through that process, I came up with a personal mission statement that, and this is three years ago, that... I wanted to um, contribute to the church at large uh, five leadership resources in the next five years. So I came up with five, but I did it in three years. So uh, nothing wrong with a little efficiency. <laughs> um, Corey, if, uh, I uh, also want to give a shout out uh, to two guys in this room. Uh, one is Corey and one is Andreas, who's uh, both are on our staff at Redeemer. Uh, Corey is one of our pastors. Andreas is, is an intern there, plays in our band and, and many other things. And um, they are part of, um, I'm not sure what you call it, Corey, but um, they publish a newsletter called Follow the Leader. And I want to give Corey just a minute or two, or Andreas, um, you can share this, to tell you just a little bit about that, because it's just a tremendous resource and one you should know about. Yeah, sure. Yeah, hi, and I am not going to take too much time. This session is too important. And I would say, just to, to tee this up, um, what Joel is about to walk everyone through I have the privilege of having him at my disposal, and so he gets to walk with me and coach me through a lot of life and leadership. Um, but one of the, the things that, that Joel does is he, he's helped me be able to discern the important from the urgent, and so much of ministry and life feels like we're dealing with the urgent all of the time. And so he's given me processes and systems and a lot of what you're going to see today that have helped me on a day-to-day -day basis be as productive as possible. So just a big shout out for what you're going to hear. Corey, th don't take your time talking about me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Joel means it. He's, he's helped my life. Um, and then, yeah, so we're, we do this thing called Follow the Leader. It's a newsletter. It gets published. One just went out 30 minutes ago. Um, and we have, uh, I have five people that, that help contribute to it. Some are in the for-profit world. Um, some are in the nonprofit world, and then some are in just the church ministry context. And so I found it valuable that different perspectives on leadership um, really can refine leadership as a whole. Um, and so, yeah, we publish a newsletter every Friday. It goes out all around leadership. And, yeah, if you want to How do they subscribe to it, Corey? Um, honestly, I think the easiest way is through my LinkedIn. 
I have daily posts that I post daily, um, and so through that you can subscribe through my LinkedIn page. So. So it's Carrie Garrity, G A R I T T Y. C O R E Y G A R R I T Y. Yeah. Or you can come talk to me. But. Andreas, you want to? Last name. Uh, G A R R I T Y. Yeah, awesome. You know, my name is Andres. It's a thing I've worked on with Corey. So I actually work for the YMCA. I'm the executive director in our city on that. Um, so just you know, walking alongside with Corey, just really seeing how we can develop the next leaders in our community. You know, we see that there's a lot of lack of leadership, right? We have two age groups. We have our older seniors on, and then we have the young ones, their kids. But there's really nothing in between. So that was kind of the idea of why things are things are happening, why we're coming together to work, to really see how can we provide tools for people to just continue to develop themselves. We think it's necessary. Uh, in order for us to make change in our community, to make church you know, change in the church as well. Uh, so we're excited to be able just to provide those resources and see what we can do to really change the world. Thanks, Andres. Yeah. I used to admire leaders that were older than me. Now that I'm old, I admire leaders who are younger than me. <laughs> I learn a lot from these guys. All right, Corey, let's go to the next slide. Um, Many professional uh, church workers I've known overwork and sacrifice themselves and their families to accommodate their work habits. I did, and it cost me and my family a lot. Overwork led to a heart transplant, and preparing, having, and recovering from the transplant took over three years. Three years just gone. I was useless at work and home during that time. My body was fine, but truthfully, my mind was a mess. I couldn't trust what the narrator in my mind was telling me to do or say. It was like another person was living inside of me. It took years of therapy and a support group of fellow heart transplations to find some peace. And I have to say that I still don't feel like the same person I was before I had the heart transplant. Um, that said, I'm very happy that I did it. And uh, I very, uh, feel very blessed to have these extra years of life. So why did I overwork? Honestly, I thought working long hours was a badge of honor and a sign of success. I also thought it was necessary to get all my work done. I never seemed to have enough time to get everything done on my to-do list. That always made me anxious. Well, I was wrong about all of that. If I had been more mindful, I could have been more productive at work, more present with my family, and lived a healthier life. We're at our best when work and home reinforce each other rather than oppose each other. Next slide. Um, first of all, to begin the eight myths of productivity, uh, we need a definition of what it means to be productive in the 21st century. The first productivity studies were done in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in American factories by a man named Frederick Taylor, a mechanical engineer. His aim was to make manufacturing as efficient as possible, to make more goods in less time. His critics accused him of turning workers into robots, but his methods worked and became very popular in manufacturing. Taylor's view of productivity still influences how many of us think about productivity today, even though we don't work in a factory. If your goal is efficiency, a productive day is checking as many things off your to-do list as possible. However, you're a knowledge worker. And knowledge workers are part of the project economy, not the manufacturing economy, where much of our work is developing something new, a curriculum, a service, a program, an event, or solving a problem, making a decision. 
Consequently, the goal of a knowledge worker isn't efficiency. It's quality. The 20th century, in the 20th century, the mantra was to do more with less. In the 21st century, the mantra is do less better. If you make that mindset shift, you'll see an increase in your productivity. It really makes a difference. When writing a sermon, preparing a presentation, formulating a bot budget, your goal is quality, not efficiency. Does that make sense? When deciding or solving a problem, you want the right answer, not the quickest one. A factory wants its workers to speed up. A knowledge organization needs its workers to slow down. Paradoxically, when you do, your productivity will increase. Finally, ministry leaders experience the tension between working in the organization and working on the organization all the time. Working in the organization keeps you busy and constantly on the go. Working on the organization is different. Um, What's going on? Oh, I'm sorry. Working on the organization is the opposite. You need to slow down, calm down, relax, think, and reflect. For many of us, this is uncomfortable because we always need to be doing something. Next slide. Here's the first myth. Multitasking increases productivity. Multitasking is not doing a bunch of different tasks all day long. Multitasking is trying to do two tasks at once, like texting while driving, having a phone conversation while clicking your way around the internet, or correcting homework while watching TV. Researchers have been studying multitasking since the 1980s, they call it dual task interference. And study after study consistently finds that multitasking causes a reduction in efficiency and accuracy. Why? Because the brain can only focus on one thing at a time. To multitask means you have to switch from one task to another. But the switching isn't seamless. When you switch, some of your attention remains stuck thinking about the task you left. Neither task then gets your full attention. So to increase your productivity, only have one project on your desk at a time. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. And put your smartphone in a desk drawer. Mm -hmm. Why? Because having a smartphone nearby, readily available while working on a project is the same as multitasking. A recent study shows that one smartphone nearby, even if you're not interacting with it, reduces your cognitive abilities. In that study, about 800 people completed tasks in two lab experiments designed to measure their cognitive capacity. Before completing those tasks, the researchers asked participants to either place their phones in front of them face down on their desk, keep them in their pockets or bags, or leave them in another room. Importantly, all phones had sound alerts and vibrations turned off, so the participants couldn't be interrupted by notifications. The results were striking. The participants whose phones were in a different room functioned the best, followed by those who left their phones in their pockets. In last place were those whose phones were on their desks. The mere presence 
of our smartphones that is like the sound of our names being said or a crying baby. Something that automatically exerts a gravitational pull on your attention. Resisting that pull takes a mental toll on par with being tired. So if you're working with your phone on your desk, you're working tired. That cognitive capacity is critical for helping us learn, reason, and develop creative ideas. So even a negligible effect on cognitive uh, ability can be significant. And if you think if everyone in the ministry has their cell phone with them all day, the cumulative effect on productivity can have a considerable impact. Now, why are smartphones so distracting? Even when they're not buzzing or chirping, us, chirping at us. It's really not that they're addictive. I think I used that word last year. It's really just a bad habit. And the reason um, we um, have it with us all the time is because they benefit us, right? They are our personal hubs connecting us to each other and all the world's knowledge. Our phones are important and relative to many aspects of our everyday lives. Research in cognitive psychology shows that humans learn to automatically pay attention to things that are relevant to them, even when focused on another task. So again, part of your brain is paying attention to your phone just as if you were multitasking. I suggest you share this information with others in your ministry and consider adopting some phone guidelines, especially during meetings when you're trying to problem solve or be creative. I would suggest everybody leaves, if you go to a meeting room, everybody leaves their phone in their office. You will get a lot more done. Next one. Do the easy tasks first. Doing the easiest work. Uh, by the way, by the way, to come up with these uh, productivity myths, I didn't Google them. Um, these were all things, except for one, eh, kind of, that uh, I have practiced uh, in my life and seen others practice. So that's where these come from. Um, this, particular, this particular myth I picked up reading a magazine article at an airport, and it encouraged you to do your easy tasks first. And that does sound like good <coughs> advice, and it is at times, like when you're in a funk and can't get going. The idea behind doing the easy stuff first is that it builds momentum. Because every time you complete a task, you get what's called a dopamine bump. That's a hormone in you, and it's your reward transmitter for when you complete a task, your brain gets rewarded. It's part of God's design for achievement. It's why he expects us to be productive. He built it into us. And uh, your brain loves these dopamine bumps, and so it wants to get on to another task just as quickly as possible and check another one off. Here is the problem. Every easy task that you do uses some energy. Consequently, when you finish all your easy work, you won't feel like tackling your essential work because you'll already be tired. The human brain is powerful, but it's limited. It can't operate at total capacity all day. Study after study has found that one's brain is best for the first three to five, four hours of the workday. That's what you have. This is part of God's design. Consequently, you should do your most challenging work first and save the easier task for later in the day. Again, we'll talk about this a little bit more. 
one of the most strategic and productive tips I can give you is prioritizing your to-do list. They're not all equal. Do what's important first. This ensures that you'll have a productive day. If you've ever ended the day just tired but disappointed because it didn't feel like you accomplished anything, it's probably because you didn't engage in your most important work. If you were like me, you probably got sidetracked by unproductive conversations and busy work. Which brings us to the next myth. Stay busy. After about 90 minutes uh, of deep work, you'll experience some cognitive fatigue. You'll have a tired brain. If you continue to work in this state, your creativity, production, and quality will suffer. So I suggest you take a break. In one study of more than 12,000 white collar employees, those who took a break from work every 90 minutes reported a 30% higher level of focus, 50% greater capacity to think creatively, and 46% higher level of health compared with peers who took no breaks or just one during the work day. But staring into a smartphone or browsing the internet doesn't count as a break. <laughs> a restorative break involves either exercise, that is you get up and move, a conversation, or even spending some time praying or reflecting. A restorative break, oh I'm sorry, 10 minutes is sufficient, and this means that walking somewhere, talking with, something, talking with someone, especially something other than work, praying, or even daydreaming will work for you. Around noon, six to seven hours into our day, our energy really begins to fade, even if we had lunch or maybe even because of it. The best way to recover, and this is going to hit you uh, as this is impossible, the best way to recover is to take a nap. <laughs> the most productive people in the world nap every day. It's true. 20, 20 to 25 minutes is all it takes. You don't want to nap for more than 26 minutes is the limit. After that, you're likely to fall into deep sleep, and then you're going to wake up droggy and foggy. You don't want to do that. Uh, if Paul was here doing the, uh, the computer, he would tell you what a game changer taking a nap is because he now takes one after hearing this every day. Um, if, you, if it's just not uh, appropriate in your workplace, and it probably isn't, unfortunately, uh, take a 20-minute casual walk, but do one or the other. Take that walk preferably in an area with more trees than cars. Like sleep, nature restores our brain and our energy. In fact, if you have a meeting in the afternoon and everybody's feeling a little droggy, take a walking meeting. You'll be more creative. Too many high achievers operate almost entirely without replenishment, never taking a break, working while having lunch, pushing past the point of weariness. If that describes you, give yourself a break. Literally. Give yourself a break. Please listen closely to this quote from Michael Taft's article in Scientific American, Why Your Brain Needs More Downtown, Downtime. Here's what he writes. Americans in their brains are often preoccupied with work. Throughout history, people have intuited 
that such puritanical devotion to perpetual busyness does not translate to greater productivity and is not particularly healthy. Your brain requires substantial downtime to remain industrious and generate its most innovative ideas. Idleness is indispensable to the brain. It is paradoxically necessary to getting any work done. Remember, we're talking about a different kind of work. We're not talking about factory work. In summary, never mistake activity for achievement. And I'm wondering if this is true in your ministry. I did this workshop for our whole staff at, at Redeemer School and Church staff. There were about 40 of us. And one of the conclusions the staff came to is that everybody was way too busy. Running around the campus, you know, everybody always in a hurry, always in a hurry. And I'm wondering if that's true in your ministry, constantly busy but still falling behind. And I'm wondering, who do you relate to more in the Bible? Are you a Mary or are you a Martha? Next slide. This is a really helpful little tool about attention. The key to productivity Listen closely to this. The key to productivity is not managing your time. Time cannot be managed. I can't make this go faster or slower. The clock is going to be 90 minutes. And I can't manage that. All I can manage is my attention. What do I pay attention to? That I can manage. So what you want to do is you want to spend as much of your day as possible in quadrant number one, enjoyable and productive. They're usually also very meaningful to you. And the task must meet all three criteria. And here's the thing that, is, that they found out in a study at Mayo Clinic, a study that um, went over well, let me just say this. You want to spend at least 20% of your time in quadrant one. Doing stuff that's enjoyable, productive, and meaningful. This is not busy work. Recent research by Mayo Clinic found that if you spend at least 20% of your time at work doing activities you love, you are less likely to experience burnout. <coughs> Quadrant two tasks are unproductive and distracting, but you like doing them. <laughs> Quadrant three tasks are necessary and productive, but unenjoyable. You hate doing them. <laughs> hate might be too strong of a word, but. And quadrant four tasks are necessary, but for you, unproductive and unenjoyable. So they don't do anything to increase your productivity at all. It's just something you have to do for somebody that you're collaborating with. Um, by the way, um, research shows also that um, uh, it's much more, st much more stressful to work uh, where you have to work collaboratively than working by yourself. We work a lot in ministry on teams and uh, that causes a lot of stress sometimes. Now, I suggest you give quadrant four tasks and as many of quadrant three tasks as possible 
to your administrative assistant if you have one, or maybe a volunteer. And what your assistant may need some training, but it will be worth your time. And what I found out with my administrative assistant that what was unenjoyable for me was many times enjoyable for her. She liked doing them. And that a lot of times had to do with detail work. That is not my forte, and it, it, I just don't like looking over the same thing over and over to make sure every I is dotted and T is crossed. Shelley did. And a great, great satisfaction that she could improve anything that I was working on. It really made her feel like, hey, I'm really helping Joel out. I'm important in his life. And she was. Well, she still is. All right, next slide. The longer I work, the more I get done. Elon Musk is probably the poster child for that. He often brags about working 100 hours a week, saying that he can accomplish more than everybody else because he works so much. So people like him believe that time is flexible and energy is fixed. We think we can get a consistent return on our effort no matter how many hours we work. That we can be as productive the 50th hour of the week as we were the first hour. But the opposite is true. Energy flexes and time is fixed. Each day has the same number of hours while our energy swings up and down depending upon multiple variables including the time of day, if you're hungry, your emotional state, and others. This means that there's an actually an inverse relationship between hours worked and the productive expense of your energy. At some point, the more you work, the less you get done. Remember again what it means to be productive. It's quality. And when you're working past eight hours a day, the quality of your work goes down. Jack Nevison, the founder of New Leaf uh, Project Management, did a meta-analysis of several studies on long work hours and found a ceiling. Push past 50 hours of work a week and there's no productivity gained from the extra time. Instead, it goes backwards. One of the studies he examined found that 50 hours on the job only produced about 37 hours of useful work. At 55 hours, it dropped to almost 30. I experienced that all the time. I thought I could be as productive at 11 o'clock at night as I could be at 8 in the morning. And even though I would find time after time that my work at night, when I looked at it in the morning, wasn't good enough to keep, I kept doing it. That's what it means. I was the opposite of mindful. I was mindless. Again, why does this happen? It's because our bodies and brains please listen to this, need to rejuvenate every day to be at peak performance the next day. We replenish our energy in these ways. Seven hours of sleep, moving for at least 30 minutes every day, connecting with our loved ones, playing, reflecting, and unplugging. And can you do these daily if you're also working 10 hours every day? And the answer to that is you can't. There isn't enough time. Which means you start the next day with less energy than you had the day before. And then the next day even less energy. It's just wash, rinse, and repeat. 
and it's not being mindful about what your body needs and your mind. Unfortunately, the process of rejuvenation introduces another paradox. Research shows that when our bodies and minds need to recover and reset the most, when we're most depleted, we're the least likely and able to do something about it. When work is demanding and we're feeling overwhelmed, we slide into a downroad spiral of working longer hours, taking fewer breaks, and sleeping less. And that's a problem. Research at the University of California, Berkeley, found that, quote, a solid night's sleep made people twice as effective at working out complex patterns and information. In another study, researchers found that 30 uh, found people saw 30% more anagrams after periods of rest that included rapid eye movement, which we get the longer we sleep. Rapid eye movement is usually happens between the fifth and seventh hour of sleep, and that's when you really gain it. If you sleep less than seven hours, you don't get all of that rapid eye movement, so you, you don't get the deep rejuvenating sleep that you need. During the stressful times, we also tend to eat less healthily, pick something up at McDonald's on the way home. Even though adequate nutrition and hydration are essential to replenishing energy levels. Further depleted, we have less energy and motivation to take time out to relax, exercise, or engage with our families, leading to low recovery, and in turn, further exhaustion the next day. I know there are weeks when you have little or no choice but to work more than 40 hours. That's reality. However, I am saying this. Working 50 or more hours a week is not sustainable or productive over the long run. You can do it for a few years, especially when you're young, but there will be a cost. Your health, relationships will likely suffer, and eventually so will your ministry. I suggest you post Psalm 127.2 on your bathroom mirror and read it every morning when you awake and every evening before you go to bed. It says this, It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning till late at night, anxiously working for food to eat. God gives rest to his loved ones. I urge you to, to accept God's gift of rest. It is part of his design, and don't fight it. Next one. Daydreaming is a waste of time. <laughs> to set this one up, we'll begin by differentiating between a task and a problem. A task is something you know how to do. A problem is something you don't even know or are sh not sure how to approach. In either case, problems need ideas. And while many of us were reprimanded for daydreaming while growing up, and actually we couldn't help us because it's the brain's natural reaction to boredom, New research shows that mind wandering increases one's creativity and ability to generate ideas. So if I'm boring any of you, you probably started mind wandering. Because when your brain is bored, it's going to shut down because it wants to save energy. Your brain is always looking for ways to save energy. In his book, Hyperfocus, author Chris Daly asserts that this, this creativity that happens when you're mind wandering has to do with how learning and creativity work in the brain. Whenever you, whenever you encounter new information, your brain stores it in a bit. When you learn, you connect new bits to unrelated or to, to um, related bits you've already accumulated. Learning builds on learning. 
creativity comes when you connect unrelated bits. This is why intentional mind wandering leads to moments of inspiration. If you don't focus on anything, your brain randomly looks for connections. And when it connects two unrelated bits, Eureka, you gain a new insight. Have any of you ever experienced this? Taking a shower maybe? Mm -hmm. Doing something relaxing and all of a sudden an idea you've been, you've been working on pops in your head? That's what this is from. You want to give your brain opportunities for that. Walking away from something when your mind is going in circles when, is when you often get clarity and creativity. So if you're stuck on a problem and you're working on it and you just can't seem to gain anything, walk away from it. That's the best thing you can do. Sometimes you need to get away from your desk to get closer to your answer. One of Steve Jobs' strategies for boosting creativity at Apple was to have walking meetings. We talked about that a little earlier. <coughs> Research supports that strategy. In one study, researchers found that participants created 60% more solutions to a problem when they walked than when they sat. So when you have a problem but need ideas on how to solve it, take a walk. But make sure you have a phone to record your thoughts. You can lose an idea just as quickly as you get one. And it is really frustrating when that happens because you're not going to get it back. It is a one, it's just a one at a time thing. Don't evaluate your ideas while walking. Contrary to popular belief, you can't judge the merit of an idea while it's still inside your head. You can validate your ideas later. The goal of generating ideas is quantity, not quality. Refuse the temptation to judge which ideas are keepers. Just write them down. And write as many down as you can. Remember, quantity is what you're looking for. In one study that, that I, I read, um, well, in one article, I should say, that I, I read, uh, again, Steve Jobs uh, was... Um, kind of famously said at one point that the thing he was most proud about at his time as Apple were the ideas that he said no to. And so that says something about focus, but there's another part to that, to that story. If you've got, and, and the part to that was, is that he had a thousand ideas to choose from to find the one right one. He didn't just have five or six, a thousand. And that's really, for me, the takeaway from, from that quote is that you're going to find better solutions with the more ideas you generate. Um, when trying to solve a problem with a group, using a hybrid model of individual brainstorming and group brainstorming produces the most ideas. In the usual way we do brainstorming, you bring the people together, you put on the, uh, on the whiteboard what you're trying to solve, and then you ask everybody to share their ideas, right? And uh, how many people in the group contribute? A few. All the extroverts. And what, we, and what we often find is that the person who says nothing has the best idea. Okay. So here's how you do this. I suggest using the nominal group technique. By the way, if you'd like a, a, a handout about uh, in detail how to use this, um, you can contact me and I'll send you that handout. But I'm going to give you the gist of it as we go on here. So here's how you use the nominal group technique. To begin, you convert the problem you're trying to solve into a question. 
So if your problem is we have too many people who um, are walked out of our church and haven't come back from the pandemic, you would, you would turn that into a question is how can we stop or how can, how, how can we get people to come back to church? Something like that. Does that make sense? Send the question to each member of the group 24 hours before you meet. And ask them to write down as many solutions as they can on their own. And tell them that the goal is quantity, not quality. Don't worry about being right. Just write down as many solutions as you can. When you meet, the group leader goes around the table and records one idea from each participant at a time on a flip chart or a whiteboard. The idea should be recorded verbatim with little or no paraphrasing by the leader. If you're not sure what to write, ask the person, can you make that shorter so it isn't so long? Can you clear that up for us instead of you doing it for them? However, leaders are allowed to ask questions for clarification of the idea. The process continues until all ideas have been recorded. So um, the, the round robin means that you start with one person. Like I would start over here, give me one idea. Lucas, give me one idea. Paul, give me one idea. Beth, give me one idea. So everybody participates completely. Whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, everybody gets to share all their ideas. And you're going to generate a lot more ideas. When all ideas have been recorded, the group discusses and clarifies each idea. After the discussion, the group is now ready to start choosing what they think is the best idea. And you do this through a process of ranking or rating. When rating an idea, each participant distributes um, a set number of points, like 100, across the ideas. For example, one participant may give idea number one, 25 points, idea number four, 40 points, and idea number three, 35 points. So you can spend your points any way you want. If you want to spend all your points on one idea because you think that's it, you can do that. Um, the way I generally used this is that I used it with sticky notes. And, and generally you want to give, say you, you have 10 ideas that were gen generated, each participant gets four, four, um, four sticky dots to spend. You want to get about 40 to 50 percent dots to how many ideas you've generated. And you don't have to be exact on this. You just don't want to give them too many, and you don't want to give them too few. So that's kind of a, a nice benchmark to use, 40% of the ideas. And then you just have people go up, and I have them all go up at the same time so they can't watch everybody they, and, and start you know, building on what everybody else is thinking. They all go up at the same time and start putting their, their sticky note on the idea or the ideas that they vote for. Um, if you rank them, you would, put, you, you would ask your participants to put them in order. So if you had 10 ideas, put them from the best idea to, to what you think is the, the worst idea and rank them. Um, I, I've tried both and I think the rating system is by far the best way to do this. Then the next step is to discuss that first vote. And this brief step in the process is designed to examine items with inconsistent voting patterns or provide an opportunity for a discussion of ideas perceived as receiving too many or too few votes. So you can do a little politicking for your, your idea and reasoning for why you think your idea is a good one. Um, while this step seldom results in radical changes in how the groups perceive an idea, it can result in a more accurate final vote. And then you do the vote as many times as needed until you get down to one solution that has the most votes. Am I making any sense? The ones that don't get any votes or get fewer votes, you just start eliminating them. And you just keep going around, 
keep voting until you come down to the one idea. And hopefully, you got the best one. Next, one. Next slide. Clutter. Yeah. Clutter increases my productivity. Until recently, I worked in clutter. Angela, I don't remember. And Angela um, was an admission counselor in our district, and uh, we visited often. I don't know if you remember, Angela, but my office was one pile after another pile. I had piles on my desk, piles on the floor. Nothing was in a file cabinet or in a bookshelf. I just had piles. And my reasoning for this, and I found out uh, in, in teaching the, uh, the course that I shared with you, The Heart and Soul of Leadership, I'm teaching this right now in the CNH district, I'm finding out uh, that there are others like me, and they do it for the same reason. I thought out of sight was out of mind. So if I put something away, I forget about it and I never get back to it. And that's just stupid. It really is. And I thought uh, it was also uh, more creative. Uh, that was another reason I did it. And there are some studies that show disorder has some benefits, but not for the type of work we're doing. It's terrible for focused attention. When I had two or three projects piled on my desk or open on my desktop, if I hit an impasse on one project, I would jump over to another. It's the same thing as multitasking. Instead of, if I hit an impasse on a project, I should have got up and walked away from it. Hopping over to another project was unproductive and a waste of time. I work very differently now. I really take care to make sure my workspace is very neat and on um, and, um, and orderly. According to an article in Harvard Business Review, the physical environment of one's workspace has a significant effect on the way we work. When our space is a mess, so are we. The, authors, uh, the article's author found that our physical environments influence our cognition, emotions, and behavior, affecting our decision-making and relationships with others. Cluttered spaces can have negative effects on our stress and anxiety levels, as well as our eating choices and even our sleep. Scientists at Princeton University found that constant visual reminders of disorganization drain our cognitive resources and reduce our ability to focus. They also found that when study participants cleared clutter from their work environment, they were better able to process information and their productivity increased. Another study at DePaul University found that clutter was the best predictor of procrastination and that it interfered with a strong quality of life. And in yet another study, I'm really trying to make a point here, psychologists at UCLA found that subjects who felt their homes were messy experienced increased feelings of depression and had high cortisol levels. Cortisol is another one of those hormones like dopamine. And but cortisol can be really dangerous. Cortisol is what did me in. It aged my heart. When I had a heart transplant at 60, I, my heart was done. It, it had completely aged out. Cortisol is what you get when you constantly live under stress. We get increased levels of cortisol and they cause about 10 different mal uh, maladies. I mean, it really can be dangerous for our bodies. Internal clutter, next one, uh, not next slide, just here, internal. Sorry, Corey. Uh, internal clutter is what we create when we have my door is always open policy. That door may be literal, our office door, or that door may be metaphorical 
because we're available 24-7 by phone. And because we usually respond automatically, people get used to it, and that's what they expect from you. Regardless, both create, uh, uh, regardless, um, having your door open all the time or your phone on all the time and ready for calls 24 uh, 7 create internal clutter internal clutter which means anxiety from knowing you're never free from work even when you go home and it's probably true just as organizing your workspace reduces external clutter, organizing your weekly ca calendar into time blocks organizes your internal clutter. And that's what we're going to look at next. This is what I suggest you do. That you divide your weekly calendar into five blocks. And the first block, um, the first block would be uh, bedtime. Set a time so that you go to bed at the same time every night as much as possible. Your body loves routine. So you, you want to set out, set out that time. The next one I would do would be family time. When are you going to be completely present with your family? I would block on my calendar right now, after 5 o'clock, I'm with my family. I put in eight hours. Now, let's go to the top one, alone time. Again, uh, uh, what I would suggest you do is that you set a block of time on your daily calendar. Start with one, if you, can, if you can do that. And for some of you, it may be hard. Where you're going to have 90 minutes of uninterrupted time to completely focus on a project you're working on. 90 minutes of un, un, um, undisturbed time. Uh, you could tell, uh, you could put that on your calendar and let everybody in your, uh, you could just tell your assistant or whomever, if somebody calls and wants to meet with you, they just tell him, uh, he or she, she's in a meeting. She's in a meeting with herself. <laughs> Try to set two or three 90 minute sessions per week. And that might be hard to do right now again in, in, uh, with some, all the people who are, that I'm teaching right now in the heart and soul of leadership. Um, they've all set aside, it's a 90 minute, it's a 90, uh, each session is 90 minutes. And I did that purposely for a couple of reasons. One of them was that they were going to have to set aside during their work day 90 minutes to take the class. They're going to do this for 12 weeks. That's how long it takes to take the leadership course. That means they've now got that 90 minutes established. And what I'm saying is don't ever give that away. That is your first footmark for your first 90-minute session that nobody's going to bother you. And if you can get two or three of those a week, it's incredible the amount of work you can get done. Okay, FaceTime. FaceTime is for meetings. Might be meeting with a parent or a church member, whomever, uh, somebody else on your staff. So it's for meetings, any kind of a meeting. It's for coaching or working with another staff member. I call that coaching. And it's for scheduled phone calls, either ones you're receiving or ones you're, uh, you're actually, that, that are going out. And you want to, I suggest you block that time in the afternoon. Um, 
open door time is for calls you're not expecting, for someone who needs to talk for a moment, and while you're open door, when your door is open, you can expect distractions. That's a good time to do what I call t 2D emails, two-dimensional emails. And those are emails that are fact-driven. They really don't need a response. I'll meet you for lunch at, and you send that out. And uh, that's a 2D email. They don't, they don't take much brain power to compose. What you don't want to do is spend that time with a 3D email. In a 3D email, the contents has nuance, emotion, or the, the opportunity for creative thinking. In 3D communication, we exchange cues through um, tone, pace, and gestures. We discuss ideas, with complex, we ask complex questions, and we connect interpersonally. 3D communication requires a live element, a phone call or face-to-face -face meeting. In my experience, trying to solve complex problems over an email or text often makes them worse. Um, one of the things I did in the district office, myself and two other pastors were members of what we called the conflict transformation team. And when we had a congregation or, or, or a school that was in conflict that they just couldn't solve. Uh, we would go in and, and help them work, work through the conflict. Inevitably, one of the biggest contributors to the conflict were emails. Emails that were way too long, trying to express something that took a lot of nuance and took feedback to make sure you were being clear. And emails that got distributed to people who shouldn't have them. The first thing we told them to do was to turn off their email and stop sending emails. Just stop it. Um, one of the, uh, well, let me be clear about this, uh, one of the, the principals uh, in, in one of the classes said, Joel, I don't, I, I, when I'm solving a parent problem, I like to send them an email. I prefer to do that over talking to them. And I said, Kyle, tell me more. W what, what, what are you thinking? Why are you doing that? And he says, when I write an email, I have a time to review it two or three times. I sometimes have my administrative assistant read it over to see what she thinks. He said, what I'm afraid of is that I give somebody a call. I'm going to say something to make the situation worse. And I said, Kyle, why don't, why don't you prepare for your call the same way you prepare for your email? Write down the points you want to make so you can stay on track. You might even write down what you don't want to say to remind you. And you're going to find that it's going to be a better way of doing it than through email. Because email, you do not get any feedback on how your information is hitting them. And here's, this is another part of our brain. We have a bias that is built into our brain that we think everybody understands what we're saying. <laughs> and the fact is, is they don't. I think my, uh, since I've done this, and Corey knows this, um, Andreas doesn't know me well enough yet, but I often ask the question when I'm teaching or even in a, in, a, in a meeting, if I say something, my opinion, I'm always asking, am I making any sense? I discovered pretty on, early on in my, uh, uh, in, in my marriage that there were lots of times when I said that to my wife, she said no. <laughs> <coughs> all right, we got them all, right? So you can see you c color block your calendar, and that's the way you set, start setting boundaries on your life. You have a right to set boundaries. Don't let other people set boundaries for you. It's your life.
All right, next slide. Okay. All right. Planning is a waste of time. When I encourage people to plan their weeks and days like I just did, the reply I often get is, is that circumstances often determine what they do each day. It's like Mike Tyson once said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> and it's true. Um, and because, because that happens frequently or occasionally, they think planning is a waste of time. But don't fall into the either or thinking. Instead, think both and. Yes, I will plan. And yes, I can cope when unexpected situations occur. You'll be surprised how much of your week goes according to your plan when you start planning it. Not all of it, necessarily, but you can cope with that. So it's a both and situation. Don't make it either or. Planning is also easy to avoid because it takes a lot of mental energy to conceive of an ab abstract and unknown future. We tend to give much more weight to whatever's present and known to us. If that describes you, I hope you'll change and learn to embrace planning. Finally, I've witnessed a number of schools and churches that wrote plans that died on the vine. Getting them to plan again is a challenge. They all had a common problem, too many goals. Too many goals can lead to overwhelm. Your mind can only track three or four goals at a time. The other ones will be out of mind. Also, because we tend to underestimate the time it will take to complete a goal or a task, achieving a goal usually takes longer than expected. Overwhelm and discouragement lead to an abandoned plan. Even in planning, less is better. We learned this at Redeemer, didn't we? The first strategic plan we, we wrote, we thought we were doing well. We only had six goals. About 45 days into the first quarter when we were working on that, the staff suffered overwhelm. Too many goals to track. Got down to two. And that's what we usually have now. And that's actually what experts re, re, uh, um, recommend. No more than two or three goals. That's what corporate America is doing as well. I've seen school strategic plans and congregational strategic plans with as many as 50 or 60 goals. 50 or 60. <coughs> I like strategic plans that fit on one page of paper. All right, I want to share with you, and I said you were going to get a couple of tools, and I'll tell you how you can get those, but I'm going to share with you uh, what that tool is. So um, I developed uh, a daily planner for everyone who takes my course. And this uh, planner is based on research, all the research I did in putting this course together. So at the bottom, you have a morning ritual, startup ritual, down, shutdown ritual, and evening ritual. I'll teach you about those in a couple of minutes. When you sit down in the morning at your desk and you take out your daily planner, you can immediately check off your morning ritual because you've done it. That gives you a little dopamine bump. <laughs> You can go up to the top, and the other thing uh, everybody uh, develops in the Heart and Soul of Leadership class is a personal life plan that takes you from where you're at to retirement. It's one year, five years, ten years, and actually the last part of the plan is writing your eulogy. 
How do you want to be remembered? Um, and I recommend reviewing that every day, so it, it, it reminds it reminds your brain. This is what this this is what my life is about. Is everything going to go according to that plan? Of course not. But you'll be amazed at how much it can change you. Isn't that right, Corey? Yes. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Corey did a life plan, and it changed your life. I suggest you do the life plan with your spouse. Um, or that both of you do a life plan. Okay, so you could check that one off. Then you can write down today's date. This is not meant to necessarily be filled out every day. If you've got a day that's mostly filled with meetings and stuff like that, you probably don't need to fill this out. You can keep track of that on your phone. So this is designed to work with uh, digital tools and a paper planner, and I'll explain why the paper planner is so important, the scientific evidence behind it. So over on the left side, you have WIN1, WIN2, and WIN3. WIN stands for what's important now. Those are your two or three top priorities for the day. If you get these done, you can go home and say, I want it ministry today. <laughs> it's a win. Each one of those you complete is a win. Underneath that, oh, I, there's also a place for hours and minutes. Whether or not you took a rest and what you did during that rest. These are just ways to encourage you to follow the plan. Um, over on the right-hand side, things I won't do today. <laughs> I won't check my phone every five minutes. Things like that. The next one is three people I will thank today. I can't share all the research on this. The class uh, in Humbition, one of the one of the traits of a Humbitious leader is appreciation. That's what this is about. Saying thank you to people is one of the best ways you can improve the culture at your, at your organization, and it takes so little time and work. And it's just thanking people. And the best way is not necessarily to thank them for what they did, but thanking them for who they are. That's what appreciation means. I just want to let you know you mean a lot to me. If it's a handwritten note, it's really powerful. And I can tell you they have an effect. When I was in the district office, any time somebody wrote me a thank you note for what I did, I posted it on my board. It really meant a lot. And it didn't happen very often. That's why they were so special. And whenever I was feeling kind of down in the mouth about my ministry, I would look up at those thank you notes and go, Joel, you're making a difference. You're making a difference. Just keep at it. We get a too little feedback on that, and so do the people in your organization. Okay, and then um, things I get to enjoy today. Remember, part of rejuvenation is playing. That's what that's for. W what do I get to enjoy today? Or is it just going to be work all day long? And then the last one is for appointments. Now, um, uh, if you, well, let me, if you would like this planner, all you have to do is send me an email and then I will send you uh, this planner and the next one. There's another one I want to share with you today. This is called the Weekly Reset, where you plan your week. Okay, so um, they kind of work together. Which one you do first doesn't really, they, they just work interchangeably. So step number, the first page is almost all journaling. And the reason I want you to journal about what you do is it's the way you gain wisdom. Experience that isn't processed is a waste. If you want to gain wisdom from your experience, process it. And this is designed to help you do that. Significant contributions from last week. Things that you can say, hey, these are things that I really made a difference in. It's a good way to start out your week is with something positive about yourself. 
The second one is a status of last week's win. So you can write them down and then you can score them. Red means I didn't do anything on it. I got stuck. Yellow means I got part, partly there. Green means it's finished. Then the next part, what did I learn during the week? And it follows a KISS acronym. What should I keep doing? What should I improve? What should I stop doing? And what should I start doing? This is a really important section. And this is where you really start to gain wisdom about yourself and your work habits. On the next page, you start looking at what you're going to do the next week. First, you go through a list sweep. Any tasks, any secondary tasks that were on that, that first daily planner that you didn't get to, you would add those to, to your daily planner during the next week. Secondary tasks are things that... Um, now, by the way, a priority, a win for you, might be something personal. Your most important thing during the day might be going to a doctor's appointment. And it may have nothing to do with work at all. It may have to celebrate your daughter's birthday. That may be the most important thing that day. And anything you have to do with that, you want to make sure you get done. Am I making sense? It's not always work-related. Okay. So you do this list sweep and you look, defer tasks, the ones you didn't complete, and you add them to the next week. Uh, delegated tasks, that there were things that were delegated, it's ones that you didn't follow up on to find out if they actually got done. And then uh, daily notes, add anything that you wrote down on a piece of paper or something that you want to remember or that you need to do. Um, you want to gather those not notes together in your list sweep and then add them to your to your daily planner. Making sense? All right, I'm going to keep checking on that. Then uh, events, deadlines, and tasks are just the what and the when. What are they? What event? What deadline? What task do I need to make sure gets done? And then the last one um, are the weekly three wins. So you have wins every day, but you have three weekly wins as well. What are three things that just must get done this week? They're really important to get done this week. Now, that's going to be reflected on your daily planner, but it's different. So you have three wins for the week and three wins for the day. Science shows that this works. If you keep your stuff, your goals, and what you want to get done in front of you, it keeps reminding your brain that this is what we want to do. Now, ah, oh, shoot. Um, why a paper planner with all this electronic stuff around? Research shows that physically writing a goal down and typing doesn't have the same effect. And occasionally looking at it will dramatically increase the likelihood of achieving it. One study showed by almost 45%. And it has to do with writing with these three fingers and they're connected to your brain somehow. Remember, when God created us, there weren't any digital tools. And your brain isn't any different than Adam and Eve's. It's the same brain they had. And that brain wasn't, wasn't designed for 21st century. <laughs> it was designed for the Garden of Eden. Okay, so here's what I suggest you do. You put your weekly reset in your daily planner in a three-ring binder and keep it on your desk. You don't need to take it with you when you leave the office, and it's not a calendar or a place for jotting down notes. Some days you may not to use the daily planner because your day is filled with tasks and meetings that you can keep track of on your phone. The paper planner works well in conjunction with digital tools like calendars, reminders, and simple task managers. All three usually come with your phone's operating system. 
So it may be uh, for you on the daily planner that those secondary tasks you just want to put on your phone. It depends. Um, because they're not as important. Next slide. How are we doing on time? Is it over 10? 10 minutes? 10 minutes? Can I add one quick thing about this? Just really quickly, 10 seconds. That I've implemented this in, in my day-to-day -day life and it's really changed the way I behave. And I think a lot of the times we, we review and look at kind of what we do, the work that we produce, and we look at that and we review it and we refine it. But what this is really helpful is reviewing how we work which can be just as important as what we're producing. And so this is like a weekly audit almost of looking at how you've done. And so I'll tell you, it's totally changed the, the way I work and live. So, Thanks, Corey. Mm -hmm. That's why he's here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take a look at uh, quickly at morning rituals. Uh, the, the reason we do these rituals is because uh, one of the most uh, energy-consuming things you do is decide. So the less things that you can automate, the more energy you save for doing your tasks. And you should automate your, your, your routines in the morning. For instance, it might be make my bed, make coffee, devotion, meditate, prayer, exercise, shower, dress, check in with spouse, get children ready for school, drive to work. And you do those in the same order, the same way, make it like a sacred ritual. You don't have to decide when, you're, when you get out of bed what you're going to do. It's automatic. These rituals can be really powerful. The goal of your morning ritual is to arrive at work energized and ready for the day. That's what your goal of that morning ritual is. Your startup ritual begins as soon as you arrive at work. It allows you to get through a small set of tasks quickly and efficiently that you need to do at the start of each day. Might be a text or a quick email that you send out. Allow 20 to 30 minutes for this ritual. Here are some typical items. Empty your email inbox. Check text. Review life plan. Review the three weekly wins. Affirm the daily wins. Review your schedule. Review your tasks. Just get a good idea. This is what my day is going to be about. When you've completed this ritual, your mind will be clear of any nagging thoughts about upcoming tasks, messages, or appointments. You'll be ready for deep work. The shutdown ritual is the bookend for the startup ritual. And again, you want to allow 20 to 30 minutes for this at the end of your workday. Common shutdown activities include empty email inbox, transfer unfinished wins to tomorrow's planner, assigned unfinished tasks to the planner, Choose your other wins for tomorrow. Clean your workspace. Shut down your computer. Turn off the lights. And interestingly enough, one tip I got was say to yourself, I'm finished for the day. Hmm. I'm finished for the day. I'm going to be present with my family now. Your goal should be that when you're at home, you can be 100% with your family. And when at your work, you can be 100% of yourself at work. You can do both. It isn't either or. Evening ritual. Some items to consider are turn off screens one hour before bedtime and you'll sleep better. Uh, prep meals for tomorrow. Lay out clothes for tomorrow. Read, pray with spouse whatever it is. And you should try and do these rituals at the same time every day. So that evening ritual, part of that is your, your, your bedtime ritual. And the last myth. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. So my guess is, is that some of you are, are operating under one of those myths, which means that you're going to have to change your behavior. So here are just simple evidence-based principles for changing behavior. And this has been known for a long time. Number one, set specific measurable goals. Number two, write them down to remind you of what you're committed to doing. Measure your progress. 
And finally, reward yourself for positive gain. And that is a critical part of the step. You should, when you're changing a habit, that's rewarding you somehow, that habit. What you have to think about is, what's my new reward going to be for this habit? How can I reward myself? Can I, can I get extra time someplace or whatever it might be? It doesn't make any difference what it is. All four steps are critical to changing behavior. And then the last slide, I want to talk to you about uh, eight brain exercises that you can practice during the day and during the week to make sure your brain is getting the exercise it needs. These are probably going to surprise you. Smile. The eighth best way to exercise your brain is to smile. Even if you don't feel like it, smiling helps interrupt mood disorders and maintain a positive outlook at life. And even if you fake a smile, other people respond to you with more generosity and kindness. So when you have a spare moment during the day, smile. Your brain loves it. Smile when you're in the elevator or in a checkout line, and the blood pressure of the people around you will go down just by smiling at them. It's healthy for other people. Smiling stimulates brain circuits that enhance social interactions, empathy, and mood. Smiling has such a powerful effect on the brain that you will involuntarily feel happier and more secure just seeing a picture of a smiling person. Next one. And this probably is a no-brainer. Stay intellectually active. The seventh best way to exercise your brain is to stay intellectually active. Um, if you don't use, lose your, use your brain, you'll lose it. This is especially true as you age. So spend as many hours as possible engaged in reading, listening to recorded books or podcasts, watching and discussing the news, taking a class, and so on. Um, <coughs> The research shows right now, uh, there's research to support all of those brain fitness apps that you can buy right now. There isn't any research that shows yet that they work. But it looks like it's promising, but they haven't been around long enough to do enough research on to see just how effective they are. They probably are. All right. Um, another one, engaging in religious issues will also stimulate brain function. Reading the Bible, reflecting on its meaning, discussing with friends, and seriously thinking about the deeper problems facing the world are great ways of activating complex circuits in the brain. This comes from a book called God Changes, How God Changes Your Brain, and it's written by an agnostic. He's a neuroscientist. And for him, uh, religion is just any religion, any faith in God, whatever your God is. Um, it seems as if our brain was designed for God. Interesting, huh? What a, what a surprise. Consciously relax. The sixth best way to exercise your brain is to consciously re relax. And consciously relaxing is about scanning each part of your body to reduce muscle tension. It's not taking a nap or sitting in your favorite chair to watch TV. But if you add pleasant music, your body will relax more quickly. And research shows that calming music sh sharpens your cognitive skills and improves your sense of spiritual well-being. One common way of reducing stress is focusing on your breathing. You've probably heard that. However, a dozen deep breaths are not as effective as you might think when it comes to relaxation. There's a faster and better way to both relax and raise consciousness, and it's next on the list, and that's to yawn. The fifth best way to exercise your brain is to yawn. This may sound funny, but research shows that yawning is one of the best kept secrets in neuroscience. Here are 12 reasons to yawn. It relaxes every part of your body. 
It stimulates alertness and concentration. It optimizes brain activity and metabolism. It improves cognitive function. It increases memory recall. It enhances consciousness and introspection. It lowers stress. It improves muscle control. It improves athletic skills. It fine tunes your sense of time. It increases empathy and social awareness. And it enhances pleasure and sensuality. Just by yawning. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Next one uh, is to uh, actually in the book uh, it's called meditate, but praying is the same thing as meditating. Activates the same circuits. There is nothing different. Just 10 to 12 minutes of meditation or prayer appears to permanently strengthen neural functioning in specific parts of the brain involved with lowering anxiety and depression enhancing social awareness and empathy, and improving, again, cognitive and intellectual functioning. Even prayers unanswered are beneficial. And you might not be used to praying for that long, so it might be something you need to work up to. And it doesn't have to be, it, 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 it's just letting your mind go and just pray. It, it, it doesn't have to be structured in any way. It's like having a conversation with God. And the longer you can do that, the more benefits you'll receive. I still have not reached 10 minutes. Um, but getting, getting as far as I've gotten is a big thing for my brain because uh, I'm ADD. So uh, my brain doesn't, doesn't stay calm for very long. It's a, it's a real tough issue. And then the third best way is, uh, to exercise your brain is to exercise. All forms of aerobic exercise improve neural performance. That's why when you walk, you think better. There's something about your leg muscles and your brain. It works. Um, exercise boosts immune function and reduces anxiety. Doctors use it actually to treat clinical depression. And it is just as effective as antidepressants. It slows down the loss of brain tissue as you age and protects you from Alzheimer's disease and reduces your vulnerability to chronic illness. The second best one is to dialogue with others. Um, that's one of the things that older people who live by themselves suffer from and their brains deteriorate because they don't have anybody to talk to. It's really important. And then the last one is faith. And this takes a little bit of explaining. So we'll finish with this. Classifying, uh, we live in a world imbued with the luxury of choice. The supermarket I shop at has approximately 50 different kinds of breakfast cereal. I have over 200 channels to choose from on my television. I could spend hours in the app store looking for the best gin rummy game, but perhaps what we think is a luxury might be something else. Choice and the uncertainties accompanying it can be a curse at times. The fact that choice could be a curse might surprise you. Most of us probably think that the more choices will make us more likely to find the best option, and that's true sometimes. Like that, while that may be true, Regarding uh, maximizing a specific outcome, it's not the case in terms of maximizing our overall well-being. Research has consistently shown that too many choices can cause dissatisfaction with whatever option we choose. This often happens to me at a restaurant when deciding what to eat. When my food comes, I'd wish I had ordered one of my other choices, <laughs> especially if somebody else did. Because we don't want to make the wrong choice, having multiple options can cause choice paralysis. Trying to analyze everything can become overwhelming when there are more options than a select few to choose from. Research has repeatedly shown that people who always want to find the single best choice in any situation are less happy, less optimistic, and more prone to depression than those who feel that good enough options will do. Now, what does this have to do with faith? Think of it this way. If having regrets about which car you bought can make you feel bad, for which there is ample evidence, what happens when you're considering waiter subjects? 
What if you're deciding whom to marry? Whether lying to save your job is okay? Or what you should do if your child has a medical complication? And this is where faith enters. Believing that God has a plan for your life and intercedes on your behalf, that prayer will heal, that a choice to never lie or cheat ensures the best outcomes, comes a sense of certainty. And certainty brings inner peace. You're at your best when you're at peace with yourself. Researchers can even see the links between faith and decreased anxiety at the neurological level. For example, scientists have shown belief calms activity in a part of the brain called the anterior cingulate. When scientists measured activity in that part of the brain when confronting people with decisions in which they made errors, those who believed in God showed less anxiety at the neurological level about making perfect choices. Simply put, thinking about God makes religious people calmer. Our new district exec, Joel Wallers, who is who's, uh, taking uh, the leadership class, pointed out, even when believers make bad choices, they know God will use their mistakes to benefit them. Mm -hmm. Tim and Kathy Keller agree. In their book, The Songs of Jesus, they write this, quote, if we trust in God's wisdom and will, then we have peace regardless of the immediate outcome. Faith doesn't make you complacent or less intelligent. It merely reduces the vigilant, critical state we sometimes fall into when making complicated decisions. I think that is so beautiful. All right. Next one is really, what's on your mind? Any, uh, we're over time? Yes. Okay. If you have any questions or anything, I'll hang around. I'll, I'll be around today. Um, thank you so much for coming to this session. <laughs>